wanting to prove, or do you think that people have just really, really developed their common reading skills? I mean, is it possible to do that without deliberately intentionally doing so? Oh, I think absolutely, yeah. I mean, you come up with general statements, people say, yes, you think, my goodness, this, this person's in law school, I'm saying, well, maybe I do have these abilities. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, I can imagine, I don't know, bigger to it, 80, 90% of the medium psychics are like that. Then you've got 10%, I have no idea where these figures are coming from, but roughly. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> spirit world, him, 15%. Um, <laughs> who, who are then going out faking it, and there's books, and there's DVDs, and on, 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 on how to fake it. Uh, but I absolutely think most of them are sincere in their, in their beliefs. When the uh, I, 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 I got my statistics turned around there. I think 80, 80 to 90% of them are outright charlatans that know what they're doing. And the 10% maybe that's left over are seriously deluded and think they have something, or they're just crazy. Is, is there a difference between <laughs> the people who occupy different economic niches, though? I mean, if you've got some sort of old dealer who accepts a tenor every so often, right, right. is she as likely to be an outright charlatan or somebody who is such a theater? The old dealers, <laughs> the old dealer in my book, I have some old deers with their cardigan sweaters, and as soon as, the, as soon as the crowd is gone, they're like, somebody will be a joint, where's a beer? You know, they change completely. They change the completely. It's a financial thing. I think basically, um, I've never seen um, a media that can just a theater show, a, a big stage show, that, that actually believes in their own powers. It's all, you know, yeah, it's exactly. in my first opinion, they're pretty much all fake. Um, when we get to people in the scripture's church who are not making money for it, they're, you know, quite often believe it. But I think, you know, even once that believe it, are subconsciously using cold reading. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in the way that we all do to a certain extent, if someone walked in that room now, depending on what they were wearing, their hairstyle, the way they walked, right. you'd make assumptions about their, whether they're working class, middle class, <coughs> sexual orientation, whatever it Some people you know. don't even know they're doing it. No, absolutely. Like there, there no, is, I think we all do it. There is somebody so who now works for JREF, and she was a psychic. And then she saw the Penn and Teller episode. Anybody see the Talking to the Dead, the pilot of Penn and Teller? Anyway, that was the show I did, and she, I talked about cold reading. So she thought she was a real thing, and then she saw this show, and she realized she was doing cold reading. So now she works for J-Ring, so there is no problem. Part of the problem as well, I think, if, even if you kind of go, well, they're not really doing any harm because they actually believe it, and this is a little, uh, little church they all go to once a week. The problem is that a lot of the fake psychics use that as a training ground, basically, you know. Uh, I'm not sure no names, but uh, there was a certain person who um, was spotted at the back of a spiritualist church a couple of weeks before they were doing a theatre show with a notebook. And so basically, they pretty much guarantee that people who believe in spiritualism are going to be at a psychic show, so they'd already got the information from there, you know. One of, really one of my first experiences when I first became aware of the, the mediumship bracket was in the late 70s, and I saw on uh, television this guy named Eli, and he came out and did the same thing John Edward and all these guys do, and I was like, wow, that guy's really, how the hell is he doing that? So at the time, I worked in a magic shop on Hollywood Boulevard, so I remember the guy, a couple of days later, he walks into the magic shop, and I was like, wait a minute, and he goes right over to where all the mentalism props are, and I said, aren't you afraid some of your believers are gonna see you? And he, you know, he says, Sometimes I've got to be right. So then I knew, I was like, okay, he's, he's doing magic tricks. And that was really the beginning of what I, I was very interested and fascinated by that difference. Because even as a magician, I didn't see it. I was stunned. You know, this is just a bridge we said before about uh, how you frame it, you know. Yeah. And the, the, the thing is, when someone goes and sees a, a psychic, they're you know, not looking for trickery, but also they have a vested interest, they, they kind of need to believe, you know. And the longer they have believed, the, the more kind of blah 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 when something is pointed out as a fraud. But yeah. I, I think it's similar to going to your doctor. The doctor says, well, you know, what, what's the problem? What's the symptoms? And you go, well, you're the expert, you tell them. <laughs> um, you wouldn't do that, you would help them. You know, and that, that's the context in which people are going to psychics. They want help, and so you work together um, with it. And, and so with the people that call themselves, it's all to do with the balm statement, or a lot of it's to do with the balm statement, very general statements we will accept about ourselves. So, uh, which, which strangely enough are all positive. Um, so things like you uh, get the impression you've got a lot of uh, untapped creative ability. Uh, we'll go, yes, that's very insightful. Um, <laughs> and my favourite part of my statement is I get the impression you're the sort of person that accepts quite general statements about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it strikes me as a little bit, actually, that magic is a very useful transferable skill because if you weren't to be 
if you weren't to be That's a scientist. That's a magician. You could just be a very ruthless salesperson. Well, I think salespeople are are good psychics. Yeah, that sense. Yeah, there's some, you know, that absolutely. They're, they're, they're probably making a lot more money on a psychic and possibly doing a lot more harm as well. So we should have a big anti-salespeople panel. <laughs> <laughs> selling shoes for 30 years. As soon as you walk in the door, they know what shoes you're going to buy. Sure. Now, is that psychic? No, it's the Dale Carnegie course in, in salesmanship. You know, you look at your shoes, your jewelry, your hair, and they just will, they'll just go, these are on sale. And, you know, they just know. So, I mean, but nobody says to them, wow, you're incredibly intuitive. It's just a matter of doing it. I'm kind of interested in the ones as well that started out as fakes and ended up believing mm -hmm. their own powers, you know, because they just lived it so long. There's a certain guy who bends spoons.
magic thing you can do where it looks like the person's got a free choice, but you're forcing them to choose a particular card. So my friend was there, I said, choose me card and do a tarot reading, and I forced him a death card. I said, don't worry, it's just about new beginnings. Um, <laughs> 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 So 
I, disclaimers is very tricky for me. Sure. But how about you? <laughs> me, no, I'm good. I, mean, I think that it's, it's a weird distinction because, you know, magicians life for a living, uh, therefore they're the most obvious people. Yeah, honest, you know, honest, you politicians, car salesmen, you know, even doctors yeah, yeah. don't tell the truth as a, as a matter of course, you know, whereas magicians always do. The, the, the premise is that we use trickery, whereas actually mentalists and certainly psychics do the opposite. I, I think there's a very clear line on this, which is about when people, when an audience finds out what you actually are, do they feel like you've abused that relationship? So if you're going to see Copperfield and it floats, and then somebody uh, would say to you, this is how he did it. You go, that's really clever, but you wouldn't go, oh, God, what a bug. I, I, sorry, I, what? Where if, if you go to a, a, a seance show, and you think it's a genuine seance, and then to no, no, it comes out spirits, it's this and this, you go, oh, my God. And I think it's the same line with mentalists. Once you tell someone what you're at, and psychological illusions, once you tell someone what they've actually seen, do they go, no, you've abused some kind of contract there. I didn't know that's what I was looking at. Yeah. I think it's a very straight line. Oh, well, there's, there's people, there's wiggle room. I don't think it is. No, I don't think it is. Let me give you There's no wiggle room. There, there can be no wiggle room. We must not have wiggle room. I'm very <laughs> anti wiggle room. <laughs> <laughs> Someone, I say I'm this. Wiggle rooms. Okay. Are wiggle rooms covered in your book? I mean, no. By the book, no. there's any mention of wiggle room. No, no, no. no. <laughs> 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 okay. <clears throat> we all know who Banachek is, right? Yeah. He's in charge of the Randy Million Dollar Challenge. Okay, do we respect him as a skeptic? Of course we do. He uses a line that was made up, a dear friend of mine, Ned Rutledge, and the line is, when they, his disclaimer is, I use the five senses to create the illusion of a sixth. Okay? No, but then you say to the audience, you saw Banachek apparently read someone's mind, it was this. And if they go, oh yeah, it was really clever, I knew it was something like that, I didn't realize it was that. If right. they go, oh God, I didn't realize it was a... Um, he found out the information in advance. I thought it was like body language. Right. If they feel abused, then yeah. I think they've got the point that it's, it's up to what the audience experience after you tell them the truth. With a magician, they would never go, I feel abused now. They'd just go, that's really clever. I knew I was <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I, would, yeah. I would put the, the, the emphasis very much on their experience once they find out the truth, if they ever do. Well, I think it's semantics as well. You know, I mean, so someone like me, so psychological illusion is, you know, they're around me the most obvious. Even though the thing about body language or your left eye twitched and you looked at your elbow, therefore you're thinking of three states, yeah. even though that's a bullshit explanation itself, it's conceivable and it's not a psychic power. It's right. using something that doesn't exist, like you know, reading body language. Whereas actually, if you use the word psychic at any point, that puts you in a whole different league, you know, uh, and that's when you start. I think the promotion of the idea that there are such things <coughs> as psychic powers is the dodgy area. Yes, you know, it's dangerous yes. Yes. You know, I didn't see a lot of psychics jumping out of the, uh, the woodwork when the, uh, the Malaysian plane went missing, you know. And you go, that, that's the kind of belief that you're fostering and <coughs> using trickery to, to show that you're psychic. But I think, you know, mentalism is one thing, but saying that you're actually psychic is an entirely different thing. We didn't, did we see a lot of psychics come out of the woodwork for the Malaysian plane? No. no. You know, but, but when it's found, <laughs> they will do, they'll say that they're yeah, dreaming. Exactly. They wait until afterwards that they yeah. say, I had this dream. But in the 50s, 40s and 50s, people would, it was called hurling the headlines. Mentalists would come out and they would make all these statements. You don't see that any, so much anymore because now if you say, I see an airliner going down, TSA people are going to come and knock on the door and say, How did you happen to get that prediction? So I, I've been watching this latest thing and it's pretty interesting. Yeah, and also in the old days before the internet, you know, you would make a prediction by seeing something in an envelope yeah. in a press office and there was ways of manipulating that's that right. effect. Whereas now, if you're going to predict something or you know where a missing play is, why are you not saying where it is on the internet? And the information's highly retrieved as well. Yeah. You can go around yeah. making loads of predictions then, you will notice everyone and everything comes true. Yeah. Um, Richard, when you, do you think, because you've ended up with rationalist attitude but you started out as a magician, do you think that one helps to lead to the other? Uh, there are lots of magicians who are skeptics in, in terms of the paranormal. I would say the majority are, but not all. I mean, there, there are uh, very strong Christian magicians who um, teach the gospel by uh, his poor magic tricks. <laughs> 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 Changing a silk scarf with a picture of the devil into a picture of Jesus. It's, 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 it's the best thing. I've got a collection of little books that are you know, written by magicians and clowns for other 
in the clouds. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it, there's one called Dewey's Galoon, uh, sorry, Gospel Balloon Magic. <laughs> <laughs> Since they're in this rarefied atmosphere about the seance room or being on stage, they they attribute that to some higher thing that's going on, and it's like, no, it's just a coincidence. Oh, there's no way in a million that could have happened while I'm on stage. Well, what difference does it make whether you're on stage or walking on the beach? You know. So I've met a few magicians that are believers, and it's really hard to understand. You know, yes, it really it's, it's like, yeah. okay, whatever. Yeah. Are there any demographic similarities? Well, I mean, the vast majority of magicians are male. Uh, the vast majority of people going to psychics are female. So there's a difference there. I don't know about the psychics themselves. I think they probably tend to be female rather than male. Um, so, so in terms of a sort of sex split, that would be the obvious um, one. Um, but why that's the case? I mean, most magic, uh, so most magicians have sort of falling into personal skills, which is why they're doing magic. Um, uh, so, uh, I think it's what's happening with the psychic stuff is it is all about being interpersonal. So maybe there's a sort of split. It's, it's also a bit kind of you know stereotype female intuition. You know, people yeah. are more likely to trust a woman than in, in terms of it, you know being a bit ethereal rather than kind of you know. But, um, Male you know, magicians use solid props. Yes. And they, you know, um, I'm surprised there aren't actually more female mentalists in terms of you know entertainers. Witches. Witches. I find it interesting that uh, there aren't a lot of male psychics, but handwriting analysis and graphology, men, because it's more pseudoscience. Yeah, they, say they all they wore a coat and tie and they look like a professor, you know, and people are like, oh, well, I'm not going to go for that tarot thing because handwriting analysis is so much more scientific. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the same, really. It's a system. Any system, you, you can read cat turds if you want to. <laughs> it's just have a system, you know, a certain thing means a certain thing, and if you, if you learn it, you practice it, people come to you and go, okay, whatever, use panther bones, but, you know, but uh, handwriting analysis has this scientific edge to it. In fact, it. You know, um, one of the biggest selling novelty books in the States, which has sold millions, is uh, Palmistry, mm -hmm. which is reading a cat's paw. <laughs> <laughs> I know a dog's paw once at a party, a woman asked me to read her dog's paw. You feel like you would serious something somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, serious. It's an amazing story. Um, what about, um, what do you guys see as the future of magic? Yeah, that's terrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> basically, I'm hoping one more card trick will be invented, uh, because I'm, I, I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> uh, what's the future of magic? Uh, the internet is the biggest problem. Uh, in my day, you had to work hard to find out how a trick was, was done. Uh, nowadays, it's very easy, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a problem, because you, in a sense, you're not working for the solution, so you're not valuing it, I, I, I think. Um, so I think that, that poses, in, in a sense, the biggest threat because magicians are naturally a secretive lot, and the internet is, in a sense, the, the opposite of that. Uh, but then you've got the other side of it, which the magic doesn't really ever translate on camera in quite the way it's a live experience, and so to some extent, we're, we're reasonably safe in terms of stuff appearing on the web. I think people would really want to see magic live, would be my guess. Yeah, the, the part of the problem with the magic thing on TV, you kind of had a rebirth with the street magic thing, which I think was about sort of 97 onwards, and that was kind of the, you know, the wobbly handheld, uh, sort of David Blaine stuff, uh, and TV sort of styling thing. Um, and, but there was still kind of ethic to it on screen, because it wasn't, you know, the idea that it was a handheld camera, you couldn't do 
jump across. Oh, you know, the there, right? <laughs> uh, so there was a little bit of cheating going on then, but now it's, it's reached saturation, I think, with, with the, the sort of Dynamo and Troy stuff that's on at the moment. They are using Stooges and they are using CGI, not for everything, but you know, you know, there's, a, there's a kind of content for the viewing public that they are, they won't realise, you know, and it's, as soon as someone points it out on the internet, it's better. So if, you know, it's, it's a bit of a sort of moral high ground for me to so that always avoided using street uh, sutures on the street magic specials. Uh, but the problem is with it that if you if you know that there's a sutures in the program, why would you not assume that all the people are there? So right. Why not just make a film rather than do magic, use CGI for everything? And so it's it's kind of days days are numbered in that context on TV. But they'll probably you know someone will have this bright idea soon of maybe doing a magic show in a TV studio with an audience, you know, <laughs> uh, that'll be the new thing. But it, as, as Rich was saying, it's very much a wide medium when you get to close-up magician in particular, it's like, well, I don't really like that pop field stuff on stage because of, you know, trap doors or whatever, but when it's under your nose with your own real watch, or, you know, uh, so it works that way. So I think the yeah, magic will be around, not, you know, not after TV is, you know, a, a bit of dust, but, uh, but on TV, I think it's got a, a you know, I don't think it's a happy immediate future. I think that part of the issue there, again, it goes back to the emotional impact of when it's on television <clears throat> and you're not seeing it right in front of you, it's the same thing <clears throat> if you try to get a reading, so-called, on television. It just, you're not, you're not, it's not intimate, you're not part of it. So that's what, as magicians, they can't take that from us, you know, because we're playing one-on-one -on -one in a good situation when you're doing a close-up magic effect. And I think that there's a, there's a, uh, you relate to people differently when it's on television, it's just so overblown. I think there's a problem as well with the uh, kind of psychics on TV, they fare a lot better than magicians. Yeah. Magicians, you go through a hell of a lot of material with a TV magic show because the style of TV is now very fast cut, it's got to be short and easy and transfer to YouTube right. and to a minute thing, you know. Uh, whereas a, a psychic, they can, because of just these you know, pretty much edited techniques and what, what, what I call pre-show work, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting the, get the information beforehand, it's cheap TV. And I know quite a few of the psychics who are currently on TV are not even getting paid a fee for their programs because it's promotion for life. That's right. And so they make the money on the theatre shows, 25 quid a ticket, doing, you know, 2,000 right. theatres. So they're happy to do the TV for free. The TV are happy to have them there because it's a cheap show and it does get good for you as well. Okay, well, we've got 10 minutes left. Do we have any questions for the panel? Uh, the first one there. <coughs> Hi, I just wanted to ask um, about the idea of um, extraordinary claims and extraordinary evidence. I know someone from Albania who swears blind that he saw a stage um, artist, as he called it, um, sever their arm and then reattach it. Obviously, I said, okay, yeah, not, not convinced, but his extraordinary evidence was that he saw it with his own eyes. So I just wondered about the um, whether it's potentially that he comes from a different culture, he comes from a different educational background, I just don't understand how someone could literally just believe that that was possible. I, I think it's, it's, it's a, a kind of um, enhanced memory thing. I mean, the, the, the trick that springs to mind there is the big sort of meat cleaver through the arm, which does, we I did it on the specials years ago, and it goes back to uh, what's generally acknowledged as the first magic book written in 1584 or whatever, Scott's discovery of witchcraft. Uh, it's a fake knife, but, but it does look incredibly real. It doesn't actually sell the arm to come right off, but it does look as though there's blood pouring out and the blade looks as though it goes two thirds of the way through your arm. So my guess is that's what he's seen, but you know, in the telling of the story, he's not just going to say, I saw this guy with a knife, it might be a trick, I don't know. Because he's told the story, he'll enhance it slightly more, so it's that Chinese whispers thing it builds, you know. So that's the, you know, that's the problem that when, you know, if you're going to do a, a dine out on a story, you enhance it every time you tell it, you know. So I think that's probably it. I, I can say my grandmother now. My grandmother was married to a magician. <clears throat> but she swore to me as a kid. She saw Houdini and she said he walked through a brick wall. They built the brick wall on the stage, brick by brick, and she saw him dematerialize from one side to the other side of the wall. She's married to a magician. <laughs> 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 If it's an effective performer like Harry Houdini, do you believe what you want to believe? Which we should say, he did walk through a brick wall as a stage thing, and he was built, you know, on stage. Yeah. It's supposed to be a thrilling show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was but, telling the story. Exactly. The story is part of it, you know. But, but the, the, the truth of the matter is that there's a couple of cabinets.
points for either side. Yeah. So he goes to the cabinet and you don't see the point where he goes through the actual <laughs> wall, but you know, it's, it doesn't it's not so it's an interesting element. It's, it's the Chinese whisper, I haven't heard that too. That's the telephone, right? Same way. Like, in other words, you pass the information from person, person to person, and by the time you get to the third person, it's something But it sharpens up each time because people, if you say, I saw a magician saw a woman in half, and someone goes, well, with a box, it's quite a big, could have been two women. Yeah, now I'm like an idiot because I was impressed by this thing and you're not. So next time you tell the story, there were very small boxes, there couldn't possibly have been two women. Um, so it's, it's a social contract. I'm telling you something extraordinary and I'm not a fool. Um, so tell me people tell their paranormal experiences. A lot of people will say, I used to be a skeptic and then this thing happened. You know, I, I live for the day when someone says, yeah, I, I'm a credulous fool and I have experience. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's a social contract. <laughs> Trick is now thought to be the fact that some American uh, journalist made up the story uh, just to fill this kind of newspaper in 1850 or whatever it was. And uh, but people do sort of remember seeing it in the days of the Raj or whatever. And it turns out that the photograph that inspired it was actually a Chinese acrobat who used to plan this on a bamboo pole. Um, so it wasn't a road at all, but you get where it all comes from. So this story is kind of retold and passed on uh, to the extent that there are people in India reenacting the Indian road trip, the traditional historical road trip for the tourists. It never existed then. Another question? Hi. Um, I was interested in the discrepancies between the panellists on how many psychics they believe were con artists and how many are genuine. And I was wondering whether the difference could be cultural, you know, there's two British panelists who think one thing and, and, and American panelists think another, and whether the difference in perception could be cultural, but whether there could actually be a difference in percentages of how many people are con artists and how many people aren't. Um, my impression of American culture is that it's much easier, um, it's much more accepted to be entrepreneurial, it's much more accepted that it's okay to make money and it's okay to make a profit and therefore it's more acceptable to go and make money um, as a psychic um, and I was wondering whether the panel thought there could possibly be a difference. I, I think so. I mean, you know, I, I think uh, an interesting thing is if you look somewhere like India or wherever, then, you know, there's no great sort of um, social security system, then it's a weird one because, you know, that they have to make money somehow, so it's kind of accepted for them in, in a similar way to America, that you were saying bizarrely. Uh, but I think, certainly if we're talking about, you know, um, Western Europe, I think the, 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 the you know, litmus test is whether they charge money for it. It's, it's as simple as that. You know, if you have a genuine <coughs> gift and you think it's there to help people, why would you charge money? You know? um, so, you know, that's, that's the question you need to ask me. But, um, it, it, some of the con artists are very clever with that because they'll do a lot of work for charity and they donate this money, whatever, but that's after the expense they've gone, or that's the show that's being made, and the private readings are the way they make money, you know. Uh, I mean, again, a very famous psychic used to do. Uh, uh, kind of all sorts of charity work, but we're going to charge £60 an hour for, for a reading who was working from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. seven days a week, you know, for a long time. But then realise that theatres make more money because you can multiply it, you know. But uh, as I say, yeah, I've never seen anybody do a theatrical performance as opposed to a one-to-one -one reading uh, where I've considered anything other than deliberate. Thank, thank you. Let me say the word for it. Okay, no, 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 I agree with, with Paul. I think if, you're, if they're charging and making lots of money, I'm sure there's a lot of bakery involved. Yeah. If you talk about people who are charging 20 quid for an hour or something, and uh, they, I, I find it difficult to think that they're not fake, that, they're, that, they're, that they are faking it. Because you think, well, first of all, it's just not worth it money wise, and, and, and second, you should be much better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes. My, my whole thing is if they're really psychic, why do they have to ask so many questions? They're supposed to know, you know? I mean, as soon as you see these people and they're like, does that mean anything to anybody? Well, yeah. you know, it's like. Well, there's a, there's a million dollars waiting there for a start. And, yeah. um, and also, there's a, a, you know, a lottery every week. And also, I, I think that one of the things that I experience is the worse the economy gets, the more these people come out of the woodwork. Because they see that they just have to go to the local occult shop, pick up a pack of cards, learn a very remedial system, three cards or even one card. I've seen people just take the major arcana and do one card, you know. 
So, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's survival for some people. It's sort of a rather cruelly, it tends to be when there's a, a war on as well. Yeah, because yeah, like they, they want, want to talk to the dead relatives. Really. That's they, what happened in World War I. Well, World War, World War, 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 you know, right from the kind of the 1870s right through to the so I think, War. Yeah. I think personally we're in the.